We continue today in our Old Testament study. Brings us to the third chapter of the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 3. And I uh, pray that you read the entire chapter in your devotional time. But for our time here today, we're going to center in on the first five verses. Nehemiah chapter 3, starting at the first verse, reading from the NIV. Hear these words. Eliyah Shaib, the high priest and his fellow priest, went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated and set its doors in place, building as far as the tower of the hundred, which were dedicated, and as far as the tower of Hananiel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakur, son of Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the son of Hasin Ah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Meremoth, son of Uriah, the son of Hakotz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshalem, the son of Berechiah, the son of Mershashabel, made repairs. Next to him, Zadok, the son of Baana, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisor. You may be seated. <clears throat> I just want to use for a subject as we go through what is before us today, who's helping? Who's helping? Last week, we began this account of Nehemiah with the understanding of Wherever your heart is, it will generate a passion action towards the heart's direction. If your heart is in it, everything else will follow. This is why we have to be careful when we use the word love as we describe how we're committed to something. Because the expectation when we use this word love is that you're all in. Like people will say, I love the Lord with all of my heart, yet the action expectation does not seem to line up with the proclamation. But Nehemiah, his heart was all in. He's loving the Lord, and his action spoke to that heart's direction. So this week, we move from the motivation to do the work to the actual work at hand. Now, <clears throat> when, you, when you think about the church, and its purpose, more importantly, the church's work. Do you see yourself as an integral piece of this mosaic that, that makes a beautiful masterpiece, a highly functional ministry? Do, do you see yourselves as a piece in this picture such that if you're not present, or you're not functional, that the picture is not complete. Or that the picture is unrecognizable. Throughout the years, especially in this country, we've been deceived to think that if, if I just throw a huge sum of money at a program, then it will be successful. The deception is, is we think that, that, that money can overcome Lack of human commitment. It can't and it never will. This is the reason we see before us people on sports teams making millions of dollars. And all of a sudden you see them pouting or aloof or being characterized as not being a team player. As I said before, money can, can motivate an employee for about 21 days. At like a one and a half paychecks. After that, they've incorporated that into their lifestyle and they're back to that where they were mentally and emotionally before the raise ever happened. Money can make you smile for a while, but it cannot give sustaining joy. 
And I thought about this as it relates to church work. And unfortunately, the church community has fallen for this deception as well. What I've noticed is that financial struggles of a church usually overshadow the real struggle, and that's human commitment to the task at hand. The church will say, well, if we had more money, then we could do this. If we had more resources, then we could do that. But lifting up Jesus' words from the parable of the talents, that if we're faithful over a few things, we'll be ruler over many. If we're not, if we're not, if we're not motivated with limited resources to serve God, more resources will not equate to more human commitment. Okay. All right. You know, many churches look like, uh, look like a crowd in a sports stadium watching the game on the field, commenting on the game, and even at times criticizing some of the players on the field. But they never realize that if they just look down, they have on the same jersey as the people on the field. Never realizing that being on the field in some capacity is the expectation, so say God. The word of God teaches us that, that if the church has players... And what I mean by that is committed workers, then God can accomplish incredible feats that astound the world, baffle the enemy, and continue to win souls and build the kingdom. Matthew 9 and 37 says this. Then Jesus says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We've heard that. Mm-hmm. When I read that scripture, and I've read it several times, I believe that when Jesus said this, it was a snapshot of what the church looked like then. When this statement was made, it, the church was at its infancy stage. They're, they were starting out, there were not many believers at all, so it made sense. I find it hard to swallow. That this statement was a broad brush of the permanent state of the church for all times. But here we are in this modern age and this statement still rings true. But the reason that is true is not for the same reason that it was true back then. See, the harvest is still plentiful, but there are few workers because we, we got on our uniform, but, but we decided to stay in the stands instead of being on the field. We got plenty of workers, but few working. And this is a question that each and every person has to answer. Why? For those who have received the gift of salvation, received their uniform, been uh, training, been made available. They're empowered by the Holy Spirit, yet they have not put their hand to the plow and began and continued and committed to the work of the Lord through the local church. Yet too often we make excuses for lack of effort that seems plausible, and you know what? We stand on them. But as we reflect back on this particular account just for a minute, I hope that we can see the challenge faced by the remnant that returned to build this wall. That, that, that we look at their commitment and that will spark and challenge our own commitment and effort and production in this modern day harvest field. Now, what's going on here in our account that, that you may not be aware of by simply reading the narrative? They're, they're facing a huge task of rebuilding walls and gates that, that were absolutely enormous in size and shape. And there was only a scattered handful of people, so to speak, that existed at Jerusalem at that time. It, it was like asking 20 people to go secure land and build a church that would seat a thousand people. 
But we know that God has never been bothered by small numbers as long as the small numbers were ready to work. In God's economy, small numbers working together have great strength. We talked last week about Gideon, and he started off with 32,000 people to fight an army of 135,000, and it ended up he only had 300 true, available, committed warriors, and they went on to defeat an army of 135,000 with 300 men. God doesn't need numbers. What God desires is that the numbers that are present make themselves available and be committed to the task at hand. And that's why my prayer this morning was about focus and not getting caught up on distractions. So they're facing what seems to be impossible tasks. Uh, and who are the first people to put their hand to the plow? The leaders. You got the high priest and the other priests. They began the work of rebuilding, setting the examples as the elders in the community. And they put them themselves to the task at hand joyfully. And they completed the first gate. And there was a sense of accomplishment and excited like we are on our way. See, the leaders were not giving orders, but accomplishing the order that had been given by God. And they did it together. You know, one of the things that really hamper the church community is the inability for leaders to come together. <clears throat> it, it just boggles my mind that, that people call me up and say, well, well Reverend Pearl Portis, you know, would you join us for, for this march or whatever the case may be? I said, I find it ironic that everyone is starving for their five minutes of TV fame. I've already been on TV. I said, you know what I'd like? I'd like for you to be true to two minutes at my funeral. That's what I'd like. If we can do that, then we can come together on something bigger. But if we can't be faithful over the small things, we'll never get together over something big. I mean, don't. Don't come to my funeral as a recruiting mission to try to show everybody how you can fall out. That ain't doing nothing for the church. Sorry, I digress. But these leaders were making examples of themselves for others to follow. They were not just title seekers looking to be order givers. I recall a time about eight years ago, we, we, we were over in this location and we were rolling. I think that year we grew about 100 people. And, and someone walked up to me and said, Pastor, um, I want to know what it takes to be a deacon. And my response to them, I said, well, what are you being prevented from doing now, that if you had the title of deacon, then all of a sudden, all those restraints are gone. I said, I tell you what, I said, I haven't prevented you from doing anything. I said, why don't you work like you got the title and let the title follow the work? Hence, this question is a common attitude in many in the church universal, thinking that a title is what's needed for committed work. A title is what's needed to, to commit and put my hand to the plow. A title is what's needed for them to come out of the stands and finally be on the field. So I tell the title seekers, I say, what about the title of Christian? What, what about the title of child of God? What about being adopted into the family of God? What about the title of being saved and sanctified? Because see, if these titles are not motivators for committed work, then another title won't be either. You're going to be a deacon on the bench still. You got people out here calling themselves bishops. With 20 people in their storefront church that only seats 25. What are we doing? We, 
We need to be committed to serve. The title will follow. And if it don't, keep moving. Matthew 20 and 28 says, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as ransom for many. So, so listen, let me get this straight. So, so if Jesus says he didn't come to be served, but to serve, then, then how are we striving to be like Jesus, but continue to be in the stands while the serving is going on on the field? Because that's where Jesus is on the field. Listen, and you, you can write this down and meditate on it later. Servanthood is an example in action. That's what servant, servanthood is. An example in action. It's not just the concept. So, let's just say, well, pastor, all of that wasn't really about me because I'm all in. My heart is here. My hand is to the plow, and I'm making it happen. So, so don't just think that um, you, you're just going to have everything great. It's going to be roses. No problems. Because there are those that are going to come against you doing the work of the Lord in some capacity. We're going to talk more about that in the later chapters in Nehemiah. And you know, the attack may not be physical, but it may be mental, emotional which in some cases is very tough to overcome. We see in verse 5 that, um, you know, for all practical purposes, we would just read over this and we wouldn't even give thought to it, that, that this particular section of the wall was being repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisor. See, Tekoa was a small town about 11 miles outside of Jerusalem, and these nobles were town leaders. They were the people that was in charge. But they refused to help in the wall at all. Even spoke against anyone helping with the wall at all. But the people in the town were fully committed. They were all in. They were working as hard as they possibly could. But these nobles had some kind of unmerited issue with Nehemiah or they thought that if the wall was built that they would lose some kind of power whatever the case may be don't know but when people come against you doing the work of the Lord it never makes sense but it's crazy that these same nobles that were against the wall put up all this opposition yet fully expected to be blessed by the protection that would later come from a strong protected Jerusalem once the wall was built. These leaders didn't want to help. So what was the response from the common people of Tekoa? They didn't get angry. They didn't say, man, if they're not working, what are we doing? They didn't get bitter, nor did they complain about having to do more with less help. They instead not only finished the section that they were assigned, but did another section. <clears throat> what is our takeaway? We cannot let anyone, even leadership, prevent us from committing to the work that God has called each and every one of us to do and doing it. It's not a valid excuse before the Lord. Well, the leaders are not working. So I just followed suit. It won't fly with, with God. See, listen clear, carefully. If the faith community that you've been called to by God to be a member of, if that faith community is preventing you in your mind from making a godly commitment to the work of the Lord, then I believe that you must find another faith community to be a part of. Don't just sit there and die on the vine in this place where you're feeling hampered. That's not the will of God for your life. That is not your purpose. Amen? So th this is the way 
a lot of people feel. And it's the trick of the devil that's preventing them from the abundant life that God has for them. Is say, say I, I'm, I'm an imperfect person, but I'm looking for a perfect ministry made up of imperfect people. And when I find that perfect ministry, then I'm going to be motivated to be committed to work. You laugh, but people think that. See, but the work of God's kingdom will not be held up by all things being correct or having to be in place and all the boxes checked. You see, if everything had to be perfect before committing to work, then Jesus would have never came. You know, when I, the last time I checked, if I'm on my job and I'm being called crazy and betrayed and arrested and beaten and nailed and hung to a cross, these are not ideal work conditions, HR. In 15 years of being a pastor, I've probably heard every excuse there is for someone not to serve. But it's strange <clears throat> that the minute someone joins the church and in, and in six months, they, they may be an elder on the session. Or, or they may be over a particular ministry in just a few months. And some people will be looking side eye, like something's not right with this picture. And when I get a chance to respond, because you know I don't always get a chance to respond, because they ain't they ain't they ain't making me aware of the side eye. I just merely say to the side eye person, I say, well, you know, um. Where, pray tell, were you leading them to work? Were, were you, you leading them somewhere? Um, where would they be if they followed your example? I, I said, you, you know what, you remind me of the very mean person who said to someone, had just announced that they were going to be a foreign missionary. God has called them to be a foreign missionary, but they only had one leg. And that mean person laughed and says, well, how are you going to be a foreign missionary? Where do you think you're going to go with one leg? And the person replied, where all the two-legged people refuse to go. You see, the work of the Lord will get done by those who are willing, able, and committed. Don't just think years on the pew equates to commitment. God is constantly sending people here with gifts and talents to make this place better. That's what I always keep saying. You know, church growth kind of goes in waves like this. We're faithful over a few then, then God will send more in. And the more we get committed to what God has for us here, then the others that are coming in will be able to see, okay, that's the way I need. It's okay. I got to preach it anyway. Who's helping? Um, now, I want to... Um, Paint a real picture of what actually would have occurred here, because you're just not going to get this from just regular reading the Bible. This enormous project that they did it all in 52 days. These walls that had laid in ruin for almost 150 years, and but a few people with a heart from God got all the walls and the gates built in 52 days. Now. You may be saying, what these walls, let me paint a picture here. These walls were four miles long. Walls and gates combined four miles. And about 45 men are named as uh, foremen of each section. But each section was like 168 yards long, about a football field and a half, which meant they had to finish about four yards a day. They had to be moving. So they worked from sunup 
to dark, not dusk. They worked from sunup to dark. And they took every Sabbath day off and still finished in 52 days. You know, let, let me tell you what, about these walls. These walls were 15 feet thick and 30 feet tall. It wasn't no garden picket fence. They're, they're building walls to protect from war, right? That's amazing. How'd they accomplish all that? So they were empowered with the simple knowledge that God had brought all of this to happen. See, when you know that, 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 it, that it's right from God, what you're being asked to do, then, then no gates of hell can stand against you. Their strength not only came from God, but from the unity that they had among themselves. See, we can't be fighting against each other and think that we're going to accomplish great things in the Lord. <clears throat> Look, listen to me. Everybody in here, we can love one another. We ain't got to like each other. I mean, that's just, the, everybody in here ain't going to like somebody. And if you ain't in this particular group that like each other, ain't got nothing to do with you. But we can all show love to one another. What none of them could have done alone, they did together. Let me paint it like this. <clears throat> There's a story that was told centuries ago in Canada. They needed a lot of lumber moved. Um, they didn't have tractors or machinery to pull it. So one person had a horse that could pull 9,000 pounds. Another uh, person had a horse that can pull 8,000 pounds. So they said, well, well, let's put our horses together and maybe they can pull about 17,000 pounds. But what they found out when they coupled those two horses together, they pulled over 30,000 pounds of wood. This principle, for you scholars, is called synergism. Synergism is a simultaneous action of separate agents working together and having a greater total effect on the sum of their individual parts. What that means is together we're exponentially stronger than we are individually. We're not going to be as strong of a choir if everybody wants to do a solo. That was just one example. Um, I asked you a question at the beginning of this sermon. Where do you see yourself in this mosaic? And I want to remind you that um, you are extremely important. God did not call you here for nothing. Each and every person has a piece fits in its particular space that makes this mosaic called third church work. And if your piece is not here, if your piece is not functional, then the picture is marred. There is plenty of work to be done. And it's not a question of the amount of laborers. But the Willingness of those who have been sent to commit to do the work. Now, <clears throat> this was not a, a seeker sermon. This was training and reminding of all who have been called here. <clears throat> now, give me five minutes for the next part. Someone called and said, Pastor, um, you know, it's, uh, 
it's Palm Sunday. You 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 gonna have Palm at the church for us to wave. And I said, well, why why would we do something like that? And they said, you know, um, you know, when when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the horse and he came through the sheep gate and they were just throwing down palms and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. I, I said, yeah, go on. So then I said, well, as I read the Bible, that was probably the biggest case of mistaken identity ever. Why would we perpetuate something like that and want to be tied to something like that? I said, God gave you two palms at the end of your wrist. Wave them. <laughs> because here's the thing. These people were going crazy because Jesus was coming because they thought, oh, now we finna overtake the Romans. And everybody's choosing up where they're going to be in this new kingdom that's coming. They didn't realize or they didn't want to realize who Jesus was. So they were celebrating who they wanted him to be in their minds. And in less than one week, these same people, when given the opportunity to release Jesus, or Barabbas, they say, well, release him. Crucify this Jesus person that we just threw off our cloaks and waved these palms to. What needs to be said? Because we know exactly who Jesus is now. <clears throat> you know when I when I. I didn't have all of the theology straight about Jesus. And I started looking at all of these other you know, religions and you know what makes Christianity, what makes Jesus different from all the others. Well, I look at, you know, most of the mainline religions in the world. They subscribe to the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch. And in those books, it says the wages of sin is death. That means that there must be a blood sacrifice to atone for sin. Sin just does not, doesn't go unpunished. So, so therefore, God says, you know what? Mankind is my most precious creation. And I'm not going to leave them in this state where they're distance from me because of this sin issue. I got to make a way for this sin issue. And if I wronged you, the only person that can make that right is you. So God says it's up to me to make it right. So I'm just going to step out of heaven and die that death that's needed so that the sin debt would be paid. So look I'm not going to fight you about Jesus. All I'm going to ask you is what's your payment to get back right with God? Because you can't work your way to heaven. You just can't be good enough. You read Isaiah. We're going to go over Isaiah probably next year. And Isaiah calls them good works that you think they are. They call them a filthy rag. We can't build our way to heaven. We, we remember that, the Tower of Babel. They tried to do that. God says, look, this is my way to get back right with me. And I'll take all of that sin away. But if you, if you die for your own sin debt, you can do that. Then you're just dead in your sin. That there's no, there's no taking of the sin away. There's no covering. So therefore you be before God and God just sees sin. So in looking at all this and weighing all the options, and I say, well, I, I can't, if I can't do it on my own, I have no choice. If I want to go to heaven, if I want to be with God, because I ask people, I say, why do you want to go to heaven? 
because I don't want to go to hell? <laughs> I say, well, okay. Um, for me, um, I, I want to go to heaven because I, I love God. I want to go to heaven because when I look at, at my life and I see how I, how I used to live and being the king of my own throne, I almost wrecked the kingdom. And I say, I, I'm not fit for leading my own life. But I see other people that have put Jesus on the throne. And I see how they act and react. And I see when the storm comes that their house don't fall down. So, so when I put Jesus on the throne of my life and I spit continue to spend my life fighting to keep him in power. Because when I put Jesus in power, man, he was trying to storm the kingdom then. <laughs> you don't have to have all the theology straight. But here's the thing. God is going to continue to pursue you. You're just that Precious to him. God is going to continue to knock on the door of your heart and says, please, just, 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 just let me come in. Because this is voluntary. People always say, well, if God knew Adam and Eve was going to sin, why did he even put the tree in there in the first place? I say, well, because you can't have true love without a choice. And what God is looking for is true love. And, and when I understood that, I say, all these other choices out here, and I choose God. That's, that's true love. You cannot have true love without a choice. And God is asking you today, choose Jesus. That's it. Choose Jesus. And, and all of a sudden, everything is not going to be easy. But now you're going to have strength to fight that you've never had before. You don't, you don't have to, to wake up to a tear-soaked pillow with no hope and no joy. You can face tomorrow boldly and not with uncertainty. That's what Jesus as Lord and Savior does for me. And I pray that somebody is among us willing to take that step and say, you know, I don't have it all figured out. God has sent me to this place, and we're going to figure it out, that I choose Jesus today. That's one. And the other invitation is this. And I know, man, church shopping is tough. Man, I remember when me and my wife were searching for a church. Every Sunday morning. I would just get almost an anxiety attack because it was like going on a blind date every week. And for those of you who've been on blind dates, you know probably within five minutes if this is going anywhere. Sometimes I walk in the door and was like, man, if they hadn't already seen me, I'd just leave now because this ain't going nowhere. Look at what they're doing in here. <laughs> but God is going to send you to a place where you can grow, where you can be stimulated emotionally as well as intellectually. And for some who are searching, this is that place. And all I'm saying is if, if this is the place and God has made it well with your spirit, just make it known because we're like, welcome home because we need to grow. Welcome out of the stands. Welcome to the field. It's time to get the game going.